Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. This is Jane. She thinks she's just filling her car, but she's also filling the air with cancer-causing toxic chemicals used to boost octane and gas. What doesn't burn in the engine enters the air and your lungs, even your heart and brain. Bad for everyone, especially kids. Ethanol is a natural octane booster, clean burning and non-toxic. More ethanol means less scary stuff in our gas and in the air we breathe. And that makes your choice pretty plain. Jane, American Ethanol, cleaner air for Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Todd Holtman describes corn and soybean export totals. Aaron Berger talks about costs of production for cow-calf producers. Rodrigo Worley gives an overview of dicamba injury in Nebraska. And Brad Lubin discusses farm policy issues. DTN's Todd Holtman is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said Wednesday in its latest supply and demand estimates, competition from Argentina and Brazil has reduced its outlook for American soybean exports. In September and October, the first two months of the marketing year, U.S. soybean shipments were about 6% lower than in 2016. American corn exports have had a very sluggish start to the marketing year, with shipments down nearly 37%. That includes a sizable drop to one of the most prominent buyers. We talked with Todd at DTN's offices in Omaha Wednesday afternoon about the struggle for foreign demand, South American production, and the latest supply and demand numbers. Well, the December report, we usually don't have much expectations for a change in the numbers, and, and that pretty much held true. If there was one a little bright spot of hope, it came in the ethanol demand estimate. They increased 50 million bushels for corn, so that brought the corn ending stocks number down by the same amount. Uh, other than that, though, we still got big supplies of corn, big supplies of wheat, and uh, our soybean uh, situation seems comfortable right now. The concerning part of yesterday's report, and, and we've known this from tracking exports week by week, was that they brought the export estimates down for both soybeans and wheat. So if we stay in that corn ethanol arena, how closely is the corn market following the continuing discussions about the RFS and potential reform to that or the RIN? You know, Jeff, that is an issue, but right now I would have to say the market's not that complicated, um, or, or at least the market players probably aren't thinking ahead that much. We've got that concern, we've got NAFTA concern, but both right now I think are just being outweighed by the sheer volume of corn stocks and supplies that we have on hand along with a very low export pace. So it, it's very hard to uh, even imagine those scenarios beyond what we've got right now. You mentioned the soybean export number. Are we worried, given this is the time frame where the U.S. should capitalize with South America starting to run out of beans? Yeah, uh, this has been uh, a bit of a riddle to me in that our FOB soybean prices are significantly cheaper than Brazil, and yet Brazil has continued to uh, aggressively export their supplies. Now, their ending stocks, as estimated by USDA, aren't very much when they get to the end of their local season at the end of January, about 109, or 145 million bushels. Uh, that's not much. But of course, uh, they always skate by on that because they come through with a big crop in the next season. So far, it looks like the weather is good enough to support another big crop in the new season. So right now, there's just no major threat on soybean prices. Let's talk about corn exports. One of the large buyers for U.S. corn has been South Korea over the last couple of years. Since July, about, they've been a very minor player. Why? Yeah, it all goes back to earlier this year when Brazil and Argentina had a big corn harvest. And uh, right now, the exports from South America are beating us out of those Asian nations. So that's, that's really hurting us. We're seeing that definitely uh, in our corn exports down uh, 30 to 40 percent from a year ago. In North America, though, Mexico has held strong. Is that surprising? Uh, it, it is, but, you know, uh, why not take advantage of it on, when you think of it from their point of view? Uh, we've got cheap supplies right now. Who knows what's going to happen to the NAFTA agreement? So why not take it now while you can? 
You wrote earlier this week for DTN about the commodity markets in 2017 and which markets did well and which markets didn't. And you said that corn and soybeans might be set up to do better next year in 2018. Why is that? Yeah, now this is not based on any fundamental foresight that I see tighter supplies ahead or anything like that. But uh, you know, the, the fundamentals explain about half of the changes in the corn price. And then the other half is left to uncertainty. And, and part of that has to do what's going on in the rest of the commodity world. Uh, so often we've seen there's, there's a uh, correlation that the commodities that do poorly one year tend to do better the next year. And uh, we've just seen that time and time again. I think it's a psychological factor of the market more than anything else. For the farmer holding corn or soybeans right now, what do you think is a realistic rally or a realistic price that they can try to target here a few months out to get rid of some of this? Yeah, well, it's obviously a very tough spot we're in right now. Just looking ahead, there's nothing fundamentally happening to believe that, that prices are going to get much better. But seasonally, we do see some appreciation in both corn and soybeans between now and early summer. So it, it's still very possible that we could get a 30 cent per bushel gain in the uh, cash price of corn and, uh, a, and a similar appreciation in soybeans. A lot of that also, though, is going to depend on how South American weather comes through in the early part of 2018. And hand in hand with that conversation is probably the question about whether or not basis can improve at all for the farmer. Uh, it can, it should. Uh, we'll just have to see if it does. We have started to see a little bit of improvement in the cash corn price relative to the futures, but really uh, nothing to brag about at this point. Next week, Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. In its July inventory report, the USDA projected this year's calf crop would be 3% higher than last year's and 6% larger than 2015's. The agency's latest numbers looking at costs and returns for cow-calf producers indicate costs declined slightly in both 2016 and 2015. That was paired with reduced values of production for both years, however. Earlier this week, Nebraska Extension's Aaron Berger joined us to look ahead to 2018 and talk about what 2017 has been like for cow-calf producers. So for cow-calf producers, 2017 has been surprisingly better than 2016. Obviously, in the late summer, fall 2016, we saw a tremendous market drop. Uh, saw quite a bit of market recovery. There's been more strength in the cow-calf market in the last year than I think many people expected. And so actually, calf prices this fall have been uh, pretty favorable from a cow-calf standpoint. What do you think the cost of production numbers have been like? So cost of production, I would say, are probably trending pretty steady. We've seen maybe just a little uptick from a hay cost standpoint, especially in the western part of the state. Uh, some of those dry conditions in uh, midsummer have impacted hay prices, especially to the northwest part of the state, I would say. As we also look at just cow calf cost production, uh, if we think about the three major drivers, uh, first would be feed costs. Uh, in Nebraska, I would say summer grass has moderated just a little bit, but we still have the most expensive grass of anywhere in the United States on a cost per pair per month or cost per day basis. Labor and equipment would be the second big expense. That really hasn't changed very much. I would say we continue to see that being a challenge from a labor and equipment standpoint. Those tend to continue to creep up a little bit. And then the third one would be what I would call replacement cost or cow depreciation. Uh, we've seen that drop just a little bit this last year just because the cost of getting a bred female into the herd is less than it was in 2016, uh, simply because the value of those uh, bred heifers coming into the herd. So those have been the three big drivers uh, in terms of things that are impacting unit cost production. Will that continue into 2018? I guess what's your projection for next year for those producers? So my projection for next year, I think really get a handle on where you're at in your costs this year. Look at what your cost of production was for this year, then use that information to plan for next year. What are some things you can tweak or change? In terms of places where I think there may be some opportunity for people to look at how to address the cow cost. Of course, number one is feed. Uh, thinking about are there some ways to creatively utilize resources there, uh, looking at cost per unit of energy, cost per unit of protein into the cow herd. Second, labor and equipment. Uh, this is one I think we obviously always have to wage war on. Uh, it's just amazing how that can start to get away from us from a cost per cow basis. A third one is cow depreciation issue. I really think is one where there's some opportunity. Thinking about what does it cost me to get a cow into the herd? Can I increase the value of cows leaving the herd, whether she's leaving as an open cow? Could I maybe sell her as a bred cow? And then thinking strategically, are there ways to get more production out of the cows I have? Not necessarily more pounds, but more calves. Can I figure out a way strategically to get 
another calf out of a cow, and that can increase, or excuse me, can decrease my unit cost production. Nebraska Extension has held a series of workshops this year, last year, about developing unit costs of productions. Are there some common threads or common questions that producers ask at those workshops? So I really think it's just a challenge as we look at what the total over our costs are. I think some of the big things that jump out when we work with a unit cost production analysis, this cow depreciation expense is one that really jumps out. Uh, it can really be surprising. And I think the reason is so surprising is you don't write a check for it. You don't get a bill in the mail that says cow depreciation. So it's kind of a hidden cost, but when you sit down and really look at what's happening, it can really be a big one that people aren't aware of and one where I think there's really opportunity to have an impact. What tools are out there to help producers evaluate and develop their own unit cost of production? So if producers would like to go to the beef.unl.edu website, under the cattle production tab, there's a livestock and market budgets there. And if they go to that section, they'll find a sample budget for Nebraska that they can go and compare their cost to. Again, this is a budget that includes all costs, includes labor and equipment, includes some opportunity costs on investment, includes feed, and also, uh, also includes the vet expense. So all costs are included. When we look at all costs, somewhere around $950 from an economic standpoint on a cost per cow right now. When you get to a cost per pound of calf produced or cost per calf, uh, we're looking at around $1,100. So you divide $1,100 by pounds of calf produced, and that gives us an economic cost, in my mind, of kind of where the average producer is in Nebraska. Obviously, not everybody's average, and so they got to figure out where they are and how they would compare. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to those resources on 2017 costs of production Aaron mentioned. Nebraska Extension has released results from its survey on the Extend soybean technology and dicamba injury during the 2017 growing season. The survey compiled answers from 312 active farmers on more than 190,000 acres in 60 Nebraska counties. The results indicate producers believe damage occurred not only from dicamba applications in soybeans, but also in corn. Growers also said they intend to significantly increase their use of dicamba-tolerant soybeans in 2018. Nebraska Extension's Rodrigo Worley joined us recently to outline the survey's findings. So according to the survey responses, Jeff, you know, the, the, the acres that was represented on the survey, there 20% of them were planted with extend uh, soybeans. And from those extend soybean acres, about 80% got a post-emergence application uh, of dicamba. Tell me what you learned about the injury issues in 2017 from your survey. You know, we asked our producers uh, overall whether they observed injury. About half of them did notice some injury on their non-extend soybeans. Uh, I then asked them the acreage that was damaged, and that number uh, was about 13%. So according to the survey there, again, about 13% of the non-extend soybean acres uh, uh, were injured. And where did they think that injury came from? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, we asked whether they thought, you know, the, the problem or the off-target movement came from application and extend soybeans or other crops. About two-thirds of the producers believe that that came from applications and extend soybeans, but about a third of them believe it came from late applications in corn. So we got to be mindful when spraying not only extend soybeans, but also corn. Uh, I think some of the weed issues we've experienced in the state, particularly Palmer Emirate, has pushed, you know, uh, producers to spray particularly in corn that came a little later. Uh, so when taking that route, you got to be mindful of sensitive crops uh, around you. Of the growers that said they used dicamba last year, how many said they had problems with it? So the producers that sprayed it, about 20% of them said that they did have some off-target movement uh, to sensitive uh, soybeans or non-extend soybeans. And tell me about the details of what they were spraying exactly. Uh, so we asked all those producers now, Jeff, you know, across the board, those who adopted the extend technology, uh, we asked them what was the uh, pattern of use of dicamba. And about 60% of our producers are using, that adopted the technology this year, we're using dicamba. Uh, alone or dicamba with glyphosate post-emergence. So what we're doing here, uh, we're trying to manage glyphosate-resistant weeds uh, with dicamba alone, and I think that's an important message for producers out there uh, that we're going to be putting a lot of uh, selection pressure on dicamba, and if we continue to do that in the years to come, uh, we're not only going to have glyphosate-resistant weeds, but we're very likely to select for uh, dicamba resistance, and that's going to uh, complicate uh, weed management. You also asked your growers about next year, what they plan to do. First of all, tell me how many acres you expect to see next year in dicamba-tolerant soybeans from your survey. 
Yeah, so this year they reported 20%, next year they're saying about 50% of their acres. So that area of, you know, extent soybean is likely going to double to next growing season. And then I asked them, you know, what percentage of their acres they expect to spray next year. So we had 80% in 17. In 2018, they expect to treat about 90% of that acreage. So not only we're going to increase the acres of extend beans, but we're also going to significantly increase the acres that are going to uh, be receiving dicamba uh, there. After the survey, the challenges that you saw and the results that you, you're looking at here, where does it leave us for 2018, do you think? Okay, so I asked, you know, one of the questions that I asked on the survey is, you know, for those who adopted the technology, whether they were satisfied uh, with the level of weed control, and more than 90% were very pleased, so they obtained really good weed control. So this technology has tremendous uh, potential. However, you know, a good number of producers had some issues uh, when they sprayed it. So that's one problem. And the other thing, a good amount of our producers are only using dicamba or dicamba plus glyphosate. So the way we, I see this uh, for, uh, for next year, you know, tank mixes, you know, use multiple effective modes of action. So we maintain the life cycle of this technology and be pay really close attention to the label and the requirements for spraying this pesticide. Again, we're gonna have an increase in this acreages and the acres treated with dicamba, so we gotta be really mindful of sensitive crops uh, uh, when spraying, so we keep the pesticide uh, where it's supposed uh, to be. And the last thing here, uh, Jeff, you know, we, I would encourage our producers to use this pesticide a little earlier on on the season. You know, it's a really great tool for a burn down or for an early uh, post application. Uh, however, you know, those who try to use it late post, those were the, the folks that had a little more issues with off-target movement. And not only that, when they were spraying in July or the late post, those weeds were, you know, a foot to two foot tall. And that's, you know, that's not what we want to see out there. Uh, so those were basically my main recommendations there for producers that are willing or they're going to be uh, using the technology next year. You can find more information about Nebraska Extension's dicamba survey and Rodrigo's recent Crop Watch article available through a link on the Market Journal website. In addition, we'll have more on the increasing restrictions on dicamba use in an upcoming episode of Market Journal. The December Nebraska farmer says UNL's Tractor Restoration Club took on a new venture this fall, one about preservation, not restoration. In November, the club's latest project, a 1945 Alice Chalmers Model C, was unveiled for display at Homestead National Monument in Beatrice, Nebraska. The tractor is there because it was used by the last homesteader in the United States. You can read about the preservation project and the tractor's background in the December Nebraska Farmer. Nebraska Extension Policy Specialist Brad Lubin says there are several farm policy issues those in the industry should be aware of as we head into 2018. In Nebraska, property tax reform has been a significant focus for state senators and the state's governor. On the national level, trade discussions related to the North American Free Trade Agreement continue. Genetically modified food labeling could garner more attention with the rise of gene editing, and legislators will also hope to move a farm bill next year. We talked about these areas with Brad Tuesday morning, starting with a look at the progress for a new farm bill. You know, fundamentally, we do expect a farm bill debate to get started in earnest uh, in committee and then moving on uh, past the committee to the floor sometime in early 2018. Both chairs have talked about uh, uh, getting ready, getting uh, essentially legislation in, in place and, and to propose and move forward. Uh, for all the discussion about the potential reforms to the commodity title, the ARC uh, equations and the ARC versus PLC decision, uh, it's still fundamentally a broader debate about the budget and some major challenges like funding proposed changes to cotton programs or dairy programs or even the livestock industries ask for a vaccine bank. All of those that take new money that you have to wonder where the, where the budget's going to come from to pay for such things. Any major changes as it would relate to Nebraska farmers that you see right now? The fundamental discussion over ARC and PLC may leave that program largely intact as it is with some modifications to the ARC formula, for example. Uh, but the biggest implication for Nebraska producers, and all producers frankly, may be that we expect a new decision on ARC versus PLC for the producer to make in 2019. And that new decision could be very, very different than what they uh, had a decision back on in 2014. Let's move on to trade. Mm -hmm. How real do you think the threat is that the U.S. walks away from NAFTA? You know, the best prognostication seems to be that this is the 
hardest, uh, sort of uh, most threatening uh, negotiating strategy you can come up with uh, to promise to walk away if we can't get this resolved, but yet everyone thinks that somehow we've got to get to the finish line and get it resolved and, and renegotiate it as opposed to walk away from it. All the analysis points to the importance of trade, the integration of, of the, uh, uh, the North American continent here in terms of a, a trading sector. And so it's difficult to imagine walking away, uh, and yet uh, that seems to be the threat at least to, uh, uh, at least to push for a, a tougher negotiating strategy. One other federal issue before we move on to the state level here in Nebraska. The update on food labeling yeah. is what? Well, food labeling is that interesting issue, and we may always be dealing with this issue. Uh, but when Congress uh, passed legislation to effectively preempt a myriad set of state-by-state state labeling rules, that federal legislation required disclosure of GM technology or GM processes in food products. But USDA has to come up with the definition of what specifically is covered and how it's disclosed. Uh, and you're stuck with a debate over, well, when is a GM product labeled and when is it not? Uh, is it uh, the kind of product where the, where the trait is still in the, the food product or is it the kind of uh, byproduct of a, like soybean oil that doesn't contain genes? Is that still a labeled uh, component or not? And then even more complicated, the new technology of CRISPR and, and gene editing, that's not technically gene transfer, so is that covered under the same definition as, as our first generation GM technology? There's a lot of questions here yet unanswered and a lot of uh, debate yet to happen. On the state level for Nebraska, perhaps the most apparent question is, what's the reality of property tax reform in 2018? Right. You know, property tax reform uh, has been a priority uh, and it continues to be, uh, by all accounts, the, the top priority of almost every uh, taxpaying interest group out there. Um, and yet we're also dealing with a budget crunch uh, and uh, uh, underperforming state revenues, at least underperforming relative to forecasts. And so finding funding to make any sort of uh, uh, tax relief or finding funding to deal with school finance, which by all accounts has to be a fundamental component of any tax uh, proposal. Um, uh, those are difficult propositions to, to, to finish, um, but um, one expects to see more, uh, more debate in the legislature this coming year over further tax reform. If it's not done in the legislature, will it be done via referendum? We hear that, and uh, it's, it's quite possible to imagine a referendum uh, process, a petition going forward at the same time that we uh, introduce legislation and have a debate in, in the legislature, uh, and we may deal with it one way or the other. Um, either way, we'll require some rather difficult choices on other taxes as well as spending uh, in the coming year. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. During this last week, we basically dealt with several fronts moving through the state, quite a bit of wind associated with them, some slight cool downs, but in terms of moisture, really nothing to really write home about. Uh, most of the major precipitation this past week occurred on Thursday as we had a front move through, and we've seen precipitation light as it was anywhere from northwestern Nebraska through central Nebraska, and then things dropped off as we moved eastward. So this dry trend has continued and it has had an impact on the drought monitor. And so if we look at the latest drought monitor, the one thing we're gonna notice is the intense dryness down to our south. Uh, we're looking at four months departures in this region, anywhere from six to upwards of 12 inches. More importantly, the expansion of dryness across the central plains is a reflection of the last two months where we are basically been precipitation free for the most part. Now there is one small area in the eastern panhandle and western sand hills that is still carrying a little bit of moisture from the shorter term time periods, but over the next two weeks, if we don't get precipitation, would expect to see this fill in. So speaking of precipitation, what do we have in store? Well, here's the current upper jet stream for today. We have a trough to the west. In front of it, we do have a ridge building into the region, bringing some warmer air into the central part of the country. Low pressure system forms down in the southern Rockies and is expected to keep to the south of us, keeping all the moisture down along the Gulf Coast. 
You can see a little bit of orographic lift up into the north central Rocky Mountains, but outside of that, precipitation free. Now as this trough begins to split, uh, move eastward, it splits most of the major energy states of the south as we have high pressure building into us on Sunday. There is a chance as the front moves through that we will see some precipitation in the panhandle, but it's not looking extremely likely. Major precipitation over that drought core area. And then we try to see a little bit of cool air slide in as we go into Monday as high pressure lifts across the northern plains from the central Rockies. We do have low pressure showing up in southwest Kansas, but again, most of the moisture associated with this will be confined right along the Gulf Coast and up the eastern seaboard the next couple days. As we start to see high pressure build in in anticipation of another strong trough moving into the western United States. So here we are on Tuesday, high pressure firmly in control. That should lead to some warmer temperatures during the midweek period. Most of the precipitation stays in the Pacific Northwest and light along the Gulf Coast as it starts to move its way up the eastern seaboard. And by the time we get into Wednesday, we'll turn our attention to yet another trough starting to move into our region. A low pressure system lined up from the northern plains of the central Rockies will start to lift some moisture up into the region. And the best likelihood for any accumulating snowfall as we go from Wednesday through Thursday would be in the northwestern one quarter of the state as that trough has begun to progress eastward on Thursday. That will allow some of the uh, energy from these low pressure systems to throw some precipitation over the su southern plains, but how much farther northward it get remains the open question. And then as we go into the day on Friday, that trough deepens, big fetch of moisture coming well to the east of Nebraska. The cold air pulls into our region. Looks like we'll start to see some precipitation breaking out in the Texas Panhandle as early as Friday. And some of that, by the models, it starts to spread out on the 24th, possibly giving us some accumulating snowfall across southern Nebraska and in the extended forecast, we actually see that cold air really pulling into the region from Christmas through New Year's. Very intense cold wave expected. And in terms of precipitation, this looks like the best storminess pattern we've seen in the models for the central and southern plains in the last two months. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, dicamba use in Nebraska, farm policy, and costs of production for cow-calf producers. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Jeff Peterson will be our market analyst. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.